Um, thank you for that. Um, I apologize to everyone. The University of Texas in San Antonio, where I teach in the College of Architecture, decided against all odds that today was the day that I was giving my final exams. And since I teach in the graduate school, final exams consist of oral defenses and projects, and that went on, well, too long, let me say. Uh, I was surprised to find that two of the students presented projects about, guess what, the Hay Street Bridge. Um, both of them were about the potential connectivity of the bridge, which I don't think anybody has recognized. Um, the most extraordinary one uh, found a way of knitting four different communities together by way of the bridge using the highways, that is the underside of the highways. Um, and I won't go any further into that right now. Um, and I apologize again for not having heard um, all of the speakers, but I have heard many of you before, and I think I gather what the general tenor of this is. So, um, with that in mind, uh, commissioners, what are your comments? Um, uh, first off, uh, I'd like to thank each and every member of the public that came forward to speak. Uh, all of you brought up very valid points. Uh, some were presented in a very articulate manner. Some were just more compassionate with uh, a real enthusiasm, and I can understand that, and I feel for you and have an empathy for you in that regard as well. And um, you have opened my eyes, and you make me proud to be a San Antonio for having such compassion. So with that in mind, um, basically what I see as this project, um, there's, there's a few things, there's several things actually, but this is a very complicated issue all the way around. And there are some issues that are not the purview of this body. And the purview of this body is basically uh, the downtown design guidelines. So I think it's kind of in, premature that we're even here because there's some legal aspects that have not been ironed out that are still working their way through the courts. Uh, I understand that the city uh, council at this time is entertaining and obtaining uh, guidelines for protecting the view shed of not only the Hay Street Bridge but of other historic structures within San Antonio aside from the missions as well. So I think it's a bit premature that we're even here, but yet here we are. Okay. And since we are here, let's take a look at it of what our purview is, and that is based because it is. Um, Mr. Chairman, could I interrupt you really quickly? I'm sorry. Um, the, the applicant actually hasn't had an opportunity to present the citizens to her to, he, to be heard happen first, so we, we need to allow them an opportunity. My apologies about that because I'm coming in late on this. So. Alright, um, I, I will stop and I will pick up after the applicant has had their time to speak. Thank you. James McNaught, 112 East Pecan, representing the property owner developer on the project. And I understand I'm probably not a very popular person right now. Maybe not because of the project, but because of how late it is. I'm still going to be speaking about this. But I do have a short presentation that I'd like to go through to, um, as Mr. Garcia was talking about, sort of the purview and, and what we're really talking about with this project. I think we're all familiar with this site, so I'll skip through some of these items. Um, size of the units, you know, people have talked about being four or five hundred square feet up to a thousand square feet for a two bedroom. Here's a perspective that I think is important to, to see the separation between the, the building and the bridge. And you know, while we're here for the certificate of appropriateness on on meeting the downtown design guidelines, okay, this is this is an important issue that I want to talk about, and that's the zoning. I think it's a few people have mentioned it, but it is an important issue because the zoning entitles the property. We have a legally developable property that we are following the rules on. The downtown zoning is was established in 1989 for this area, for the entire downtown area. It was uh, the downtown business district at the time, and then it was converted to the D district in 2001. And it allows, it's the ultimate mixed-use district. It allows 
retail, hotel, office, and a broad range of varied housing types. I mean, it's something really important about the downtown district is the kind of varied businesses and housing types that you can get. And you can see it's all of this area is surrounded by other D except for the neighborhood on this side. So we're in a very unique situation. But this project is actually meeting the exact purpose of what the, the D zoning was put in place for and entitled to do. Everything that we're doing on this property is a, is a legally developable right that we are just taking advantage of. One woman mentioned property rights. That is a, that's part of this. Some of the things that I want to point out from the downtown design guide, consistent design standards and guidelines, create a livable and sustainable downtown, emphasis on walkability. The downtown design guide is intended to be a means of balancing the traditional qualities of the downtown with the demands of contemporary use. And one part in particular says, in the spirit of affording maximum creativity, the project need not adhere to the letter of every guideline. A project that demonstrates a clear alternative approach that achieves the intent of the guidelines will be recognized as a valid alternative. And that's and that's really important to, to point out that these guidelines are just that, and that we are trying to meet them to, to create a good project, but they are not the letter of the law. One part of the, another part inside the guidelines is that there is a degree of scrutiny applied where your project lies that on those blue streets, there is a higher level of scrutiny. And as you get down to the other streets, there's a lesser degree. You can see the little red dot in the corner, that's where this project is. It's not in the highest level of scrutiny. It's not even the, the top three, three tiers of level of design scrutiny in the guidelines. That affords us a little bit of creativity and a little bit of a, uh, a creative approach in, in meeting those guidelines, which, as you've heard, that staff has said that we do meet those guidelines. You know, we, we've mentioned a lot of issues tonight, and, and Mr. Garcia again mentioned that, that, that we're talking about the purview of the HDRC, like the lawsuit. You know, the lawsuit has been decided at the appellate court. There has been a, an appeal to the Supreme Court, but they haven't taken it. So there is not a pending lawsuit at the moment. It, it has been decided, and that gives us the entitlement. We have the entitlement on the property to continue building as we are. We're following the process as anybody would and trying to get these get this approval and we go through building permit approval and and planning and there's several levels of, of development approval that we still have to go through but we're not asking hdrc to do any of those things we're not asking for a permit um, zoning designation or interpretation of that law we're only asking whether or not we have tried to meet the guidelines with alternative approaches and with the idea of trying to make a good project, which we are. We're, we're trying to, to do something good with the community. It's not about just, I know I'm going to get caught up in all the comments, but it's not about just making a dollar. We want a good project. I, this, we are all from San Antonio. We want something good here. And we believe that we are creating something good. And there are differences of opinion. That is clear. But we're not here to discuss differences of opinion between the neighborhood and the development. We, we're here to talk about the project that we we're trying to bring and hope that we can and meet those guidelines to, to take advantage of the, the legal rights that we have. I drew two, two arrows up there just to show that later in the slides there will be uh, sections through Cherry Street to show some context. Uh, this is a photo that I took uh, from the area that I thought was as close as I could get to the retail space. Um, I just stood where I, I felt, you know, looking at the drawing, I was. You can see the tower in the picture. And then it looks almost identical to the one the architect took. I wasn't trying to do that. It just, it, you know, we stood in the same general spot to get this picture. This is an important part of the, the project because of what it is that we're trying to actually to do to meet the guidelines. In particular, the active spaces. We have retail on the northeast corner and on the southwest corner. One of those is on Cherry Street, the other is on the public right of way of the bridge itself, trying to create, locate our active spaces. It's not a requirement that the entirety of Cherry Street be active. It's a requirement that we locate our active spaces in those places. We have the lobby and the other two retail spaces. This is just a view to show the kind of activity that we're, we're looking for. 
one of the guidelines is talking about eliminating the view of the parking. I know that it is, it's been commented on several times that having parking on the ground floor isn't ideal. There were a lot of considerations, putting, whether to put the, the parking underground or to try to, well, we don't have enough room on the side, it's only 1.4 acres to, to put it um, on the other side of the building. But we're trying to follow, follow the intent of the guidelines by creating a blockage for the parking with a green wall and the, the brick wall. We're varying that so that there is a little bit of uh, diversity along that side. We're, we're putting awnings in along that wall, along the retail space, to bring down the pedestrian scale, as the, the guidelines are asking us to do. This is a view that from the and Cherry to show some of the, the pedestrian space that we are trying to create and could be active. The, the wall that has the, the parking garage there, um, as Ms. Savino pointed out, is about 170 feet, but it has a lobby on the other side, and there's a bridge beyond that. There is a connection there. People will be walking on that street and experiencing it. But one part of creating a pedestrian environment, I think, is important to point out is people. And we've got a vacant lot right now, and we're trying to bring people to the neighborhood. The neighborhoods are made of these people. These could be valuable members of the community and, and want to be. This is a section showing that you've seen before, showing the, the relationship of the bridge to the building. And as some people pointed out, it's misleading. It could be, but it's actually misleading in against our favor. I want to point out that the distances, first of all, from the bridge to the edge of the building is approximately 53 feet. That's from the first part of the building. Where the largest or highest part of the building is, it's 83 feet away. And that's from the deck. But here's where it's possibly misleading for us. If you cover up the bridge that's in the back, cover up the, the Whipple part of the bridge, we're looking at about 51 feet. Compared to where this section of our building lines up with it, we are actually lower than or right about the height of it. The part that's higher is further behind. If you look at this plan, you can see that area, that tower that's 71 feet wide is 83 feet away and doesn't line up with the bridge. There is no section that you can take that goes through that 58 foot parapet and the bridge because it's before you get to the bridge. So by the time you're actually on it, you're at this height. Here's a section through Cherry Street showing the size of the building. You can see the two-story structure on one side and a four-story structure on the other. It is not out of context to have a downtown that has a two-story on one side of the street and a four-story 60 feet away. One of the things we tried to take care of in, well, let's see, there's another section here showing a one-story structure and then how the, the four-story looks across the street. Again, downtown zone, it does not, it is not strange to see these kinds of structures and heights next to each other. Some of the massing issues, this massing that we, we, we did here, lowering the side that's closer to the bridge, stepping it back on the third floor there, and then stepping it back again to the fourth story, these were all massing issues that we did in response to the bridge. Massing is part of, part of the downtown design guidelines that we're looking for. We did that. We listened to uh, the Design Review Commission, we listened to comments from city staff, we have listened to comments from, this, from the neighborhood. I know that we haven't responded the way they wanted to, but that doesn't mean we're not listening. We're trying to make things work in the best way possible and bring forth the best project that we can. So for on the, on the wall that is facing the street, on Cherry Street, we've stepped the four story back further away from the street level so it's not just um, the 54 foot, 58 foot wall. These are some of the you know, just a pedestrian shot of the entryway. Again, part of the design guidelines to create the entryway along an active street. This is a view of before the, the structure is in place and then after. Yes, it blocks the view of homes from the bridge. That's part of living in a downtown. We're not trying, we're not trying to hide the fact that you can no longer see a house from this perspective. However, if you walk further down, you will be able to see it. This is part of the active space that we're talking about. It's a view from near the Alamo Brewery, through under the bridge to the, the retail space on the other side. 
again, trying to create these active retail spaces in response, direct response, to the design guidelines. These are not things that we would be doing to any apartment complex. They're all direct responses that staff has reviewed, that other members have reviewed, and a chance to say, we can meet them. That's, that's it for my presentation. I'm here for answering your questions. All right, thank you, Mr. McKnight. So we'll, we'll back up and How much do they expect to generate revenue-wise off the lease of those retail spaces? Um, right uh, okay. sure. We don't. That's, that retail. Sir, space. please speak into the microphone and introduce yourself. Introduce yourself for the record, please. I'm the developer. Uh, that retail space was done as a response to. The, the neighborhood and you all suggestions. That um, that space is, is really not desirable retail space. It's, it's retail to suicide. No one's gonna be, no one, it's gonna be hard for anyone to make a living. So the answer to your question is we're gonna probably have to give that comp that retail space to get a good operator in there. We're, we're not gonna make any money at all in that retail space. We're actually not losing money. But we are we are sensitive because we have 148 new people wanting to live there. So we're going to want to to be sensitive to what they want, an ice cream shop at the court. I mean, that's, the, that's my number one priority. I don't think we'll go there. We'll probably go on the, the retail space by the bridge. But we're very sensitive. Uh, we see it more of a, I think not the right word, but a stall. So if you can have a drive thing about uh, a retail, I mean, uh, uh, an ice cream, some, uh, some cup, just to have all kinds of amenities, a flower shop, uh, just thinking out loud. I don't think it's going to be. Uh, State I don't think it's going to be a bank branch, but it's going to be, it'll, it'll be active and alive. But we're not going to make it on the retail to that right now. I've already offered it up to uh, uh, a person that wants to open up a restaurant. He said, how much is it? Great. That's what it's going to take. But we're, we're, we're willing to do that, to energize that, to get some retail down and get this thing jump started. But that's what it's going to take. Okay, thank you. And I'll just take a round. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, the, the reason I'm going with this is because, uh, from a business standpoint of view, uh, we're not making any money off of that space. So, really, to me, it appears that that's booking this project with retail on both sides is to satisfy that it's mixed use. No, I, I get it in response to the neighborhood. I mean, uh, it, 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 the neighborhood and the, the HDRC is saying they want retail and they want some mixed use, and we'll be glad, we'll be glad to do that. You've been giving it away. So I, I think that, that it's a misnomer to call it mixed use because from a business standpoint, it doesn't really make sense. And the only reason to have it in there is so that uh, we don't call it what it is, which is actually a residential structure. This is a residential structure. Well, by and large. So as a residential structure, uh, there are some guidelines in the San Antonio Department uh, uh, design guidelines. Mike, if you can bring up Chapter 4 of the San Antonio design guidelines. Uh, but it's, it's still mixed use. There is a mixed use of the retail component. <laughs> And if you look at that as far as uh, what it says now, of course, it is not the letter of the law. These are guidelines. They are open to interpretation. And that's what this body is here for, is to interpret these design guidelines. And I think it's a disingenuous argument to say that it's an excuse when in actuality it's a residential. And as a residential building, the first floor of the residential should be at grade or no more than four feet above grade. And also complying with the downtown yeah, design design guidelines, parking should be either below or behind, which I've already stated. So in that respect, the parking should be subterranean, or at least half subterranean, in order to specify or to comply with the downtown design guidelines. This does not. For one, I'd say that there is, there's no distinguishing between a mixed use and a residential project. We, we're calling it a mixed use because we're trying to activate the space and, and create a better 
project. We're not trying, we're not including the retail to meet some guideline. There's no guideline that says that if you have a mixed use project, you can do something different. Um, this guideline is, or this standard is saying below, grade, or behind. We can't do below. I mean, it kills the project, it adds at least 25%, if not more, onto the project to try to, to try to make it. However, you can do behind. And in this case, talking with staff, we're trying to create the behind by using some retail space, by putting behind the retail space that's there, but also using the, the walls and the, the ivy to say we're blocking the parking garage that's there to meet the intent, which that's the intent. I mean, that's why the guideline is there, is to block the parking. Okay, let's, let's go and take a look at that. And, and that's, a, that's a very important aspect as well because it really drives home the point as far as how does this interact with the community and with the streetscape. So by and large, how does this interact with pedestrian and vehicular traffic along Cherry Street is that, okay, you've got a leasing office there on one side near the bridge and you've got three parking spaces for potential uh, residents to be able to go in and talk to the leasing agents about maybe getting a rent there. Maybe those three spaces can be also used for visitors picking up residents that are living there or not. Uh, I don't really see any parking in your plan for visitors, so the people who are living here, it seems like they're going to be all uh, single people living in these small apartments, uh, and they don't have any friends that come and visit. <laughs> There's a few things to keep in mind. One is that the parking requirements are the way for the D district. So there are no actual requirements for parking. We're putting in the spaces to, to try to maximize the, the small site for the, the residents that are there. But as in all downtown parking, um, the reason they waive those requirements is because of street parking and parking garages or other things that might be in the area to park on. That's the same for everyone in the downtown area. There are parking garages that have been built for other buildings, but by and large, you can you, you can build your structure with no parking whatsoever. We're we're probably trying to put in as much as we can to really okay. Let's let's get you on that. Um, then these these residents, you don't even have enough parking spaces for one parking space per unit. That's right. There's 124 parking spaces per 148 units. That's right. I mean that's that's part of again one of the the things we're trying to encourage about the walkability is that you don't have to have a vehicle. I have several friends that live downtown that don't have a car. Have or, or they can use street parking. Well, I, I assume you're not going to exclude a couple from renting a unit, and, and they may each have a car. That's true. But again, it's not a guideline. That, we're, that is not something that, that we are required to provide either through the zoning or through the guideline. So we're talking about a standard that, that doesn't exist. Well, well but yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct on that, except for it's, it still does bring us back to how does this interact with the community and the streetscape. So by and large, it's, it's a parking garage. But in reality, it's really a residential building on top of a parking garage. And then it's like, okay, let's go put a couple of retail spaces inside. Now, one of them is actually probably be viable, the one that's in the back corner that's uh, closest to the brewery. Uh, that one you could probably lease and, and make money off. Now, by your own admission, you're going to be losing money on the other retail space. So it's kind of hard to say it's going to make sense to include it when you can get a few more parking spaces out of that. But, uh, you know, in, in all reality, I see this in my opinion. As far as my vote goes, it's in my opinion that counts, is that uh, this is a residential project, and being such, I think the parking should be set for you. Okay. All right. Mr. Matt, I have a couple of questions. There were two slides you relied upon in your presentation, uh, number seven and number 28. We can pull up seven. And in this, you pointed out, actually this is a very similar slide, I think this just has the two blue arrows on top of it. Oh, no, it's different. All right, you point out the distance between this building and the bridge. We can go back to seven, please. All right, if 
we go to either 14, which we were just at, or 28, and we look at that space. That space is listed as being individually planned for future development. So, in fact, that space is not guaranteed to be there. That space probably will not be there, I would imagine, if you're individually planning it and planning something else. As, and neither would this sort of passeo space there. And that makes me very nervous. One issue we come into here at the HDRC is when someone does something and they sell off the property and they got it. They didn't get it. They thought they got it. And they come back before us and they say, but we didn't know. We didn't know that we were buying something that had an issue. So what is the plan for that property? And tell me why you should be able to rely upon that space for the distance between this project and the bridge. Well, that, I can't tell you what the plan is for that site because I don't represent the owner of that site. Is it common ownership? Well, actually, the, the, you're right. The whole lot is owned by the same person right now, but will be privately planted. This, that site is not part of this project. We are not proposing anything on that site that is not part of what's before you to be approved. So you can't rely on it either in that case to establish that distance, that space between two or three. It would have to be a separate approval for anything that would be built there. The thing that appeals to me about the project is that it does bring people uh, to a property. The fact that there has not been a, a building on the property for many, many years uh, is really, in my mind, just really happenstance. You have uh, warehouses on the other side of the bridge, uh, on the other side of the railroad tracks that are much closer. Uh, and, and for I, you know, I really feel like the benefit of having more neighbors in the community, uh, embracing a community, embracing an area, uh, more eyes on the streets, uh, really uh, is the, the, the highest goal of this project. trying to, we added elements along that wall to bring down the pedestrian scale. That was one of the main, I mean, I know that wall is a point of contention for a lot of people, so that was one of the main things that we did. Um, they, they spoke about, some members of the community spoke about public art instead of a, a, a vine wall, which we were completely open to. Um, you know, that's one of the things that it's within your purview on approval is to include stipulations about things that you would like to see as part of the approval. That's something that we spoke about there as well. Okay. Um, so we've been through guidelines a couple of times, and we, we I think everybody knows we have required guidelines and we have 
preferred guidelines. How many of the preferred guidelines did your team look at and say, okay, we really want to do this? And how did that come about with what we're seeing today? I think that there are, you know, as many as there are, I can put a number on it, but I, I do believe that the, you know, I'm not, I wasn't the architect, but I do believe that was part of the design process was looking at a lot of those guidelines. It wasn't, I'm mean, trying to look at the, the plans and a few of them, but they weren't standards. It's part of the massive and just overall um, look of the building. I believe that they, we, were, we were trying to emulate what would be appropriate in a downtown area, as opposed to just putting up uh, an apartment structure. I mean, if you go to an apartment structure where you have no, none of these guidelines, you just, you just put up the walls and it, it goes straight up. Every one of the massings and, and the glazing and the, the walls and the spacing and stepping back from the street, no, that's not required. I mean, those are things that we were trying to do to, to improve the quality of it along the elevation. Along the elevation on Cherry Street, you can see the, the metallic walls that are put up vertically and then the, the balconies themselves. Those were elements that were added to try to add more variety to the, the elevation of the building. Those are things that are not part of the guidelines, they're just, I mean, the standard. They're part of the guidelines to create variety. So those are just a few examples. Uh, so during your uh, initial remarks, you commented that there were some areas that you felt that you had some leeway uh, of creativity of how to respond to <coughs> the guidelines based on the proximity from just the hottest zones for the downtown district. So what element do you think you've taken, or the team has taken the most leeway with executing the most creative license anyway? As far as the, the standards or guidelines go? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I think it's the one that Mr. Garcia is pointing to. I mean, with, it, it's uh, the, the standard says below or behind, and we're looking at the intent of below or behind. And so that is one of the ones that we're we are taking an, an alternative approach to, to say we're we are creating the space that the kind of space that you want on the street by covering up the parking lot. But what if your response is not valid, uh, as was pointed out by um, by one of the folks today, that you're trying to grow 16 feet of greenery on a shaded wall? Well, it's not it's not the full 16 feet. But um, that is, you know, that's one of the things we might have to look at, and it's one of the reasons the public art came up that, uh, you know, etched steel or something like that could do the, create the same kind of cover. But again, the reason we brought it in the first place was to try to create that variety and a better experience on the street than just having it brick. I think some of the some folks are responding to the inaccuracies of, of the renderings and the plans and such, and, and that's something that we have commented on throughout the process. So still to get to this point where the dimensions of certain elements, vital elements, are still in question, I think is a little bit disappointing. Um, again, um, I'm sorry, which elements were still... That's why I was trying to provide some of those details yeah, of kind of explaining, you know, your version of, of the, uh, the photographic spots, uh, but just the renderings in general and the drafting in general <coughs> for a project that is under this much scrutiny, I think should be to a much higher degree of accuracy. Well, um, I'd like to weigh in on this now, too, but uh, Commissioner Kamal, do you have anything you want to say? Uh, I do have a number of notes from uh, the supporters and opposers to this and from your presentation, sir. Um, things actually has been said that related to the purview of this commission, um, this commission and things that beyond, but I'm just going to go over a few of them. Um, words how that would help us make a decision uh, if we're going to be done today. Um, 
some of the supporters said it, it does actually fulfill housing need, like typology does, does not exist. Uh, I do agree. And this typology is actually could mitigate crime. I partially agree, but this is not an excuse that actually mitigate crime. Although all of this is actually outside what we um, actually look at. Uh, just to make it clear. Uh, then the, uh, uh, the people who hold, who hold your respect, I, I actually do, do have a lot of valid points. I'm going to go over them as well. But uh, we were talking some of the, uh, the points raised with what the view shed. And I don't think we are looking at the viewship, we're looking at visibility in general because we don't have guidelines that looks actually or mandate a viewship at the moment. Um, so we still we're not looking at it from viewship, but we're looking at visibility. Um, historically, for over 100 years, that's something that we can look at, we are looking at. And then um, the income, people who could afford this, I need to say it, we're not also looking at this, we are. Um, abiding by some guidelines we look at, uh, this is beyond uh, what we look at. Um, but um, I have to note also, I, and I, I do agree with my commissioner, my commissioner, uh, here, but, um, uh, uh, see, I'm sorry, about the parking. Um, and you mentioned uh, something which is, which is true that the parking is not fulfilling all the needs for the uh, units because there's no actual requirement so and you're promoting walkability uh, as a component in, in downtown and this is actually pretty much common in downtown um, in San Antonio so what would have hurt uh, this is one point actually two like two major points here one, one point is like what would it hurt if you shrink the parking uh, particularly the ones that's facing the street and switch that to something else that could actually promote and be in line with more of the downtown design guidelines, something retail, something totally different, and that will minimize the greenery on, on that uh, uh, wall facing Sherry Street. You mean about the, if you take that retail space and piece and drew it along Cherry Street? Is that what you're asking? Your... Partially, here and there, yeah. yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be that one. Well, I think they, they, those were actually just market concerns. I mean, they weren't design concerns. It wasn't like we were afraid to um, go down the road of having retail, except if you walk down Cherry Street, you'll see there isn't retail on that area. That, that's part of the problem from a, a realistic perspective of trying to get a bank loan and build a project is whether or not you can get retail in those spaces. And we felt we, we couldn't maximize the area with full retail. But it wasn't a design concern. It really just a market concern. Absolutely, and I'm, I'm, that's what I expected to hear. By the way, but uh, from that point, that point actually contradict that we're promoting walkability. Because you promote walkability, you don't promote. You actually did a market analysis and connectivity through VIA and how who's likely going to live here, how they're going to be connected, whether they're going to be walkable people or not. Because what's going to happen? If that market analysis was not complete, although we're not looking at the market analysis, but there is that point, and it's part of how to direct the design here. If a market analysis is actually done uh, sufficiently, you would know who would likely to live here and who would likely would not have an overflow of parking uh, spots on the street. So you would actually have more of your parking, even though less than the number of units would actually be sufficient. So I think that point needs to be looked at uh, in order for us to actually see this as something meaningful. Uh, then visibility is something actually is a, is a concern, it's a valid concern even with, the, with all the design and review uh, committee meeting and then the hearings here. I don't think that maintaining a good visibility, we're not seeing with the building, but just maintaining visibility is something still um, Support I cannot see happening. I'm sorry, do you need visibility of oh, the bridge? That bridge. Yes. Last but not least, actually, which is the, which should be number one, community access. And I have to echo uh, Vice Chairman of Cementi here about his concern about that lot that says it's going to be for future project. Uh, so the retail in the back um, in southwest corner. And all the uh, communal area here. We're not sure even if this is going to be a community access. We're not sure. We're not. We're not.
not telling us for sure this is going to continue to be or even as is, is that the access to the, of the community to the bridge. We're not even going to be, going to be assured now that this is going to continue to be because there might be buildings um, in front of that. It's in Shirt Street. The, well, the access is through the right way under the bridge. So, I mean, you're right. We, we, I can't tell you what's going in that spot because it's not part of this project. But one of the things we're creating here is connection to the public right way, which is under the bridge, and it's not subject to um, future development. So the area where you're showing red tables there in front of that retail space, in that half circle, that's not part of the parcel, that's not included in this proposal? That is not part of the parcel. If it, it, it was built, I'm just going to go back to people who support the project because their concern or their interest in this being a mitigator for crimes that might not happen because the access will be under the bridge and there's going to be a spot behind and it's not going to be visible from the street. This is not how a mixed use actually mitigate uh, crimes. I've done a lot of research on that. This is not what I don't think maintaining an access through under the bridge hidden behind whatever development that comes in the future is something that um, actually is not going to be valid for this board. Well, I respectfully I disagree only because I'm asking for approval of this structure and you're, you're talking about hidden behind a building where we don't, that, that building isn't before us, if there even is a building to go I, I understand, but it has potential. What you're submitting to us is having the potential to have buildings in this particular future project, project which we don't know. Right, which will be addressed by this commission at a future date. Uh, another thing to consider as well that is not an alien concept of this whole area is disability. We need to get this right. This project goes through and it's not reversible. It's not necessarily, I'm not opposed to the development on this, but I'd like to see thoughtful, considerate, property development, not only for the property owners, but for the community at large. And I don't see that being addressed here. I do see some deficiencies with the downtown. I like the way you're thinking. That's why I wanted to get up and be because I sense that you're really trying to work with us. Um, I have plenty of apartment complexes that are not in the de-zoning that have less parking than the residences, and they work out fine. I made them that one, but they did. Um, the downtown is only required to doesn't care if you have a single parking spot. But with what you said, what if, because I'm, I, I really want to make this work, and I have a feeling you're trying to, to help me get this done, what if we put residences, residential units along the street? The reason I put the green wall, I saw these in Mexico City, and they were beautiful, and they were just really pretty, so I thought, wouldn't this be nice for So that's how the green wall came about. I just thought they were beautiful. Apparently, no one likes them. I get it. I'm a big boy, and I can change it. Um, what if, to hide, like you said, four feet up, what if we put units, um, door, I mean, unit along the front street of, of Cherry and, and, and energized it that way with actually people living there? And then you have, you hide the parking behind it. We can live with less parking spaces because we already are. We know that works. I mean, I, I know that, that that formula works. You do not need a parking space for every unit. Um, and maybe that's a way we can work together and, and get this over. Uh, secondly, I don't think it's I don't think it's fair to lump a project that I'm not even associated with that may or may not take place in the future and attach it to, to this one, this this green space right there. It's not mine. I have nothing to do with it, and it shouldn't be a, a considered with with this. I don't know what's going to go on there. I don't know what's going to go on across this Cherry Street in the future or behind it. It's just just my project right here, and I think we should keep it contained. Well, here's why I take issue with that. One, I'm asking, I'm not being a wise no, man. But, you, but your representative relied on that space and provided us a picture using that space. And so the reason I'm holding you responsible for that, it's actually two reasons. One is that, is that you, there's been a representation that that space is important, and that space provides a view of the bridge that wouldn't be there otherwise. Second reason is, I think, Historically, this has all been one parcel, correct? That's true. We replied. Okay. So you replied. You created the condition that makes this an issue. 
And so I, I have trouble getting beyond it. And again, especially if you sever it and you sell it, and then someone else buys it, and then they come before us and say, we paid X amount of money, and you're telling us we can't do anything with that land, which frankly is kind of, without speaking to any future project, is where I am right now, because I think that space is important in light of this development. You know, that, that you severed, you chose to do that instead of using it, and then at the same time trying to rely on it, that, that strikes me as wrong, and, and it's obvious. It, well, it wasn't, I, I did it because I, we severed it because that's the space we need. It wasn't intentional, there's no grand design of our, our scheme, it was just, um, it's not my property, and I, I, I see what you're saying, I really do, but I don't think it should be lumped in with this decision. I really, I want to work hard to get this, the, the neighborhood happy, and uh, the biggest thing I'm hearing is this, they don't like the part of the You don't like it, but most of the people don't like it. Um, I'm, help, I'm here to, to let's try to, to change it so we can go home and say, yeah, we'll approve this if he puts residential on Cherry Street. We'll approve it if, um, I, I, I would rather have it all, all residential than not have that retail there. We're going to have some because I, I think sooner or later it will, it will be. Uh, well, as, as it's presented right now, I cannot support it. Okay, what, 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 let's work together. Uh, you, you need to design and bring to us what you want. And this is what you designed and brought to us. And I'm saying I can't support it. Well, but we have been, we have worked with, with uh, DRC, we've had two DRC meetings. Uh, in all DRC meetings, I've, I've been told that, that, um, that the people, the commissioners that were there said they liked the project. So we're, we're acting in good faith, and, and we're trying, and we have to start somewhere, and we, we start. We've changed our project radically by getting rid of the driveway on Cherry Street and, and uh, redirecting our traffic to Lamar. Uh, it was you that said, let's get these get these people energized around by the age group. We did that for you. Um, I mean, we, let's move the retail, let's add retail, let's move along Cherry Street, let's let's do a better job along Cherry Street. We did that for you. So we are it's not like we're we're being belligerent or we're we're trying to get to make this work and to say that I just give us something, I'm asking for your help so we can get this done together and get out of here, honestly. Well, I can appreciate that. A as it is right now submitted, um, I'm not near there yet, but I'm about to make a motion to let out deny it, and then you can reapply and bring something else. But I want to reply. I, I, haven't, I haven't made that motion yet. I, know, but I, I, want, I want to reply properly and respectfully, and I'll do this you know, again and again. If y'all have ideas, I was very attracted to office, the idea of let's work with this guy. And I took your comment seriously. If we can put um, uh, the horse along Cherry Street and make that active and get rid of that parking, I'm happy to do it. Will you also be able to look at the community access, continuous access to the bridge, even though the lot that's nearby is not owned by you, might have other development? Oh, you know I know the owner, but it's just not me. But that will right. come to us. I, I would like to have the opportunity to comment now because we're kind of slipping into going back into a design review committee meeting, and I think we've done quite enough of that personally. Um, so I thought that we would end up in this condition where we would have a room full of people and we would have our commissioners, and we would still be scratching our heads because we're looking for some evidence of a defined parameter. So I want to key on something Commissioner Larry Zin said. Uh, this is nothing if not the definition of a high-profile project because we're all here at 10, 15 at night still discussing it. So it, it is certainly um, up to the advocates team to make sure that they've made the best possible case for this. Um, during the course of our design review committee meetings, uh, what I was most concerned about is the continued discussion about does this block of view, does this not block of view, how big is it, is it bigger than a bread box, how tall is it? So I asked the design team to give us some definition for this, and I gave them two options. One is to put balloons at the corners of the buildings uh, at an elevation that would give us the idea of their height and bulk. 
or even more accurately to elevate um, drones at those corners because those have altimeters that are regulated and can be controlled with great accuracy. Um, so we went and had a site visit on a day not unlike today when it was raining. Commissioners were out there in the rain with me and the neighbors and also the development team. And when we got there, we found a bunch of toy balloons laying on the ground, which was not exactly what I was hoping to find. So in my own mind, uh, the case has not been made here because the most critical element is the discussion about the actual height of the building. I think Commissioner Larazine and others have commented on whether or not um, we can kind of buy the images that are presented here. Um, some of us are aware of uh, how our students can manipulate images, but the question is, you know, how are they presented and are they accurate? And I'm not satisfied myself still that we understand the bulk of the building and exactly how it is uh, fitting into the fabric of this existing community. So. But are the images so far off that we, that we can't get the general idea? Uh, that's a good question. You know, the, the I, thought, I thought they were I thought they were accurate. I mean, to to uh, very accurate, and it's it's the idea. I mean, it is it is massive, and it we have proven over and over again that even a one-story building blocks the view. Understood. But so, uh, we would like to have known. The commission would like to have known precisely uh, what the uh, the height is, so that we wouldn't keep going in circles with kind of guesswork about what does this do and what does it not do. I mean, one of the, the important things that has been pointed out many times tonight is, is blocking the view, but nowhere in the guidelines is there that you cannot block a view of something else. View shed protection doesn't exist on this. So it's understood, the, but we still haven't seen the actual height of the building indicated on the site. It's a simple thing that we asked for for a site visit. But we have so the sections drawn through the site don't show the height. I mean, that's that's why we provided those. Well, we're still debating, in fact, this angle view right here. Um, you know, what is the view past the building? And there's still this concern, I think, on the part of a couple of commissioners that um, even if we could understand what the angle view is through here because of the setback on the building, and at least there is a setback on the building, um, that um, we, we find some jeopardy in this because we don't know if even that's going to be preserved. Your question about the views and the sections that you've shown. So, in an architectural set or in an architectural environment, there are rendered views and there are drafted views. And that's, the drafted views are what are lacking from this presentation, and that's, I'm pretty sure at this point we should have drafted documents, construction documents to be reviewing. We don't have those. That's an answer to your question. I would like to make a motion to deny the application as submitted. I will second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion, commissioners? All those in favor, say. One minute, please. Um, I would like to suggest or determine if it's possible that we as commissioners can take some time to digest everything that we've heard today and come back with an answer within 24 hours. Well, let me make a parliamentary point here. Uh, we have a motion and a second on the floor, and so we have to proceed with it. If the motion fails, pardon me, uh, this is our turn, and uh, we've heard a lot from all of you, and we're happy for the demonstrations that have been displayed here before of your affection for your neighborhood. But please refrain from applauding. This is not the game. All right, so Commissioner Larazine, I just have to make this point that um, in terms of parliamentary procedure, we have to move forward. Should the motion fail, then we could consider an, another motion and another move. For myself, the, the clarification may be from staff. We're voting on a certificate of appropriateness, correct? Yes. And does that preclude any further refinement of the design to achieve uh, maybe some of the, the, the 
design points that are lacking. I, I don't know that we would have any way to enforce if if you approve something today then the, the exhibits at hand today or what would be attached to that certificate well, stipulations stipulations could be included in any approval um and to answer your question first from Nazarene about um kind of tabling the item i i asked the city attorney's office and i think the the best option, I mean, the Open Meeting Act requires a 72 hour notice, so I think the best option would be tomorrow morning we could post an agenda for 72 hours from now um, or sometime after that. So it would have to, the agenda would have to be posted for at least 72 hours, correct? Thank you. Right, so again, we have uh, a motion and a second on the floor, and we'll have to see how this goes. All right. Further discussion at all? Going, going, going. All right. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same sign. Aye. All right. Um, there being only one nay, I don't believe we need to have um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a, a roll call on this one. So the motion fails. Uh, the motion uh, uh, for approval fails. Or rather, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's late for me to. Uh, the approval. 